Welcome to the Worship of Almighty God here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church Online. It is wonderful to have you here. It is a great day to worship God, and we are so glad that you are here. So with that in mind, let's worship God together. quick announcements this week. Uh, first, the movie club movie, uh, WCPC Film Club is is meeting this week uh, today at uh, 2 p.m. We're, we're changing it just a little bit. Uh, we're gonna watch the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Uh, it's a very interesting movie. It's, it's unlike m many movies that you have probably seen before. It deals a lot with memory um, and regret and forgiveness and things like that. The general premise is um, there's a technology in which someone can erase someone from their memory and um, trying to figure out, wrestle with what that means. It's a great movie and will yield really interesting conversations. It's on Netflix right now. Uh, it stars Kate Winslet and um, Jim Carrey. So watch that on Netflix. If you don't get a chance to fully watch it, you can still join us for the conversation. It's going to happen today at 2 o'clock. Uh, we'd love to have you there for that. Another announcement of something that we're going to start doing is we're going to, we want to have Christian education, uh, some robust conversation again. And, 
And one of the easiest ways that we figured to do that was to have a video that we could watch and then have the conversation happen via email. We can do that really easily um, through the email list. We have a bunch of different email lists for our different committees and for their prayer, um, uh, prayer requests. And so we're gonna make one for Sunday School as well. So if you'd like to get on that email list, uh, contact me at tyler at wexfordcpc.org. And the email that you'll get on is, is Sunday School at wexfordcpc.org. And what will happen is that we will send out a, a, a video for you to watch, and then I'll send out some questions via the email, and you just respond to those emails and send it out to Sunday School, and it'll go to everybody. And we can have a conversation on email that way. So even if you don't have access to social media or something like that, or, or the website, uh, this should hopefully be an easy process for us to have conversations about that. Uh, the Presbytery um, has made a great resource that we're going to start with and then we'll use different videos and, and hopefully this will be a real big, big uh, fun way for us to get engaged and to learn together because uh, it's an important thing for us to do right now. So if you'd like to be involved in that, again, email me, tyler at wexfordcpc.org and, and say, I would like to be part of the Sunday School and we'll get you on the Sunday School list and uh, we'll get the conversation started. As I mentioned with the Sunday School uh, email, we also have daily or regular opportunities for prayer. We have a prayer chain, a list, a group of people within our church who are committed to pray for the church each and every week. And if you have any prayer concerns, uh, the best way to get on the prayer list is to just email prayer at wexfordcpc.org. It goes to the prayer, prayer list and, and we'll be praying for it. So any concerns, anything um, that needs to be prayed for within the church can go to that. Those concerns also get... Uh, distributed to our prayer team that prayers uh, that prays every Sunday um, before worship and they get together via Zoom and they pray together and so if, if you email something to the prayer chain it'll go out to the whole prayer chain but it'll also get on the prayer list for the prayer team that prayers prays every week uh, and if you'd like to join the prayer team uh, just join them for the week we put the the contact information for that Zoom call in our email every week uh, you probably saw it today um, so if you'd like prayer or if you would like to be praying for folks, uh, those are two great ways to get involved with that. One last announcement for you for this week. We are bringing back the WCPC Book Club. Uh, what that has been in the past is that we take a book, we take about a month to read it, and then we get together and talk about it. In the past, we've read some really fantastic books, and we have a fantastic book for this month. It is this one, Jesus for President by Shane Claiborne and Chris Haw. Uh, it is a wonderful book. It's a about, it's a, from a few elections ago, and so it's uh, it's over a decade old, but it's still very relevant. Um, it's also very uh, like beautiful. It's got great design to it. Uh, there's a lot to talk about in this book, even if you're not on board with everything that it's saying. Uh, but it will yield some really, really great discussion and really relevant for us to be talking about right now. And um, sadly, more relevant now even than when it came out. Um, so you can get it pretty cheap because it's been out, again, I think since 2008. Um, and uh, it's really, it's a very interesting book. So Jesus for President, we will read it. We will talk about it the last Sunday in September at 4 p.m. after the Steelers game. Uh, and that is, I think, September 27th. So be ready for that. Get it now. Read it. Jesus for President, Shane Claiborne, Chris Haw. We'll read it in a month and talk about it. Everybody get this and talk about it because this is a great conversation that we could be having. WCPC Book Club, it's back. As we do every week, we take time to greet one another with the love of Christ. And so I would ask that you would take a moment to pause the video uh, and reach out to someone either by text or email or uh, phone call. Uh, call somebody up, let them know that you appreciate them, that you're glad that, you're in, that they're in your life and that you thank God for them. So with that in mind, let's pause the video and let's pass the peace of Christ and greet one another with the love of Christ. Good morning, guys. Okay, so I have an issue that I'm hoping you guys can help me with. I just finished running, okay, and I'm really, really thirsty. So I have this water bottle here with water in it, but I can't, I can't seem to get it out like, I put my lips on it. I try to drink it, but I don't. I don't get any water. I can hear it in here. What? What's the deal? What? What's that? Oh, it's 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 up. I need to turn it around. Oh.
Hmm. Ah. Wow, that I feel silly. I feel silly now. Thank you. Thank you. You you have no idea how much you helped me out. You know, this is just like what happens in our scripture story today. Except instead of a water bottle being turned around, it's Peter that gets turned around. <laughs> it all starts when Jesus is telling Peter and the other disciples about certain certain things that are going to happen to him. And the thing Jesus was saying that was going to happen to him were not good things. It's at this point that Peter then tells Jesus to make different choices. But that's not that's not how students are supposed to act with teachers in Jesus' time and place. Students are meant to ask questions and follow the teacher, right? And teachers were meant to lead the way. But when Peter tells Jesus to change his choices, he's acting like he's the teacher and Jesus is the student. Peter had the whole thing turned around. Just like I had this bottle turned around. <laughs> it's so silly. Which is why Jesus tells Peter to get behind him. Jesus is helping Peter to turn the right way. Just like you helped me to turn this bottle the right way so I could drink it. Jesus knows the reason why Peter has gotten turned around is because Peter is afraid of what's going to happen to Jesus. The same thing can happen for us. Sometimes we get scared and confused and turned around. When that happens, we start to make mistakes, which causes us to be even more afraid. But today's story reminds us that when we're afraid and confused, one of the first things we can do is turn our attention towards Jesus. And by turning our attention towards Jesus, we're reminded of what Jesus teaches about God and God's way to help us get turned in the right direction again. It seems like such, such a simple thing, right? Maybe it sounds so simple that it won't work. But again, think about this bottle, okay? Think about how much more I could do with this if it was turned the right way. The same thing is true for us with Jesus. Sometimes we are facing the wrong way. And the way we get turned in the right direction is by turning our attention towards Jesus. And that's the good news for today. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Please help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. so that we won't get turned around. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys. I'm going to be submitting a weekly moment for music video, and I'd like to use this opportunity in a variety of ways. I intend to use this time to perhaps recommend music for your listening pleasure and spiritual enrichment or discuss specific liturgical functions of music and worship. And I'd like to use this time to help each of you to consider the sacred nature of music each week. This week, I've chosen to discuss the function of music and worship generally, and how the huge variety of worship musical, music available to us is both a gift and a challenge. I'm also taking the opportunity I have while in quarantine in Ipswich, Massachusetts to share some of the natural beauty I'm surrounded with here at the seashore. Perhaps no other area of modern worship life is as divisive as music. Congregation and worship leaders often battle over whether music and worship should be traditional or contemporary, pipe organ or piano, church or praise team, brass quartet or jazz combo, in his book, Beyond the Worship Wars, Thomas Long explores contemporary tensions in congregational worship in an effort to move us beyond the struggle that inhibits engaging and dynamic worship. In the course of the book, Long names several characteristics of vital and faithful congregations, one of which is particularly relevant and true of WCPC. In quotes that the vital and faithful congregations emphasize congregational music that is both excellent and eclectic in style and genre. 
Music and worship is not an end unto itself. Music and worship is meant to invite the congregation to participate in ways that inspire and nurture. This happens when we listen to preludes played on the organ, anthems sung by the choir, offertories rung by the handbells, or musical works played by instrumentalists of all varieties and configuration who offer their praise and worship on our behalf. Musicians, professional, avocational, amateur, and recreational, offer their gifts in ways that inspire and nurture a listening congregation. But beyond simply providing listening opportunities for a congregation, instrumental music and vocal music has the ability to move us th through the liturgy in ways, often subconscious, that unite the liturgical elements of the worship service and foster an experience that can speak deeply to our hearts and souls. The primary role of instrumentalists and vocalists in worship, though, is to facilitate the participation of the congregation in offering its own songs to God. From our beginnings in ancient Israel to the early church and throughout Christian history, congregational singing has included hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs. Hymns are metrical compositions adapted for singing praise to God. And songs include a variety of non-metrical compositions. In our services of worship, congregations often sing several hymns or songs along with various pieces of service music like a Kyrie or the doxology. Um, at no time in the history of the church have we had available to us such a variety of congregational song as we do today. To be honest though, the variety can be a bit overwhelming. Look in the index of any mainline denomination's hymn, hymnal or songbook published in the last 20 years, and you will find early church chants, Reformation era chorales and hymns, early American folk tunes, 19th century gospel hymns, African American spirituals, contemporary Christian praise and worship choruses, short songs from the Taze and Iona communities, and hymns and songs from around the world in languages, rhythms, and styles very different from one another. The variety, while initially overwhelming, is also an exciting gift to the church. Congregational singing has the ability to unite our hearts and voices not only with those with whom we sing in worship, but with the church throughout all times and places. So rather than settling for overtly simplistic divisions into like traditional and contemporary, remembering that those terms are as relative as the hearer's own experience, congregations should strive for singing experiences that blend a variety of styles and genres together. For those of us planning and leading worship, we're careful as to how music is used in the service of the liturgy, what the genre and style requirements are for a particular piece and how a congregation is invited and instructed and supported in its fullest participation. Music is an integral part of the worship service, congregational singing especially so. Music as an art engages the heart, mind, and soul in ways that often mediate an experience of the holy. As worship seeks to inspire a deepened faith that equips us to be ever more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, music serves worship well. Each week we also make time to worship God uh, through the process of demonstrating our trust in God. Uh, we call that offering by presenting to God a portion of our tithes and our offerings, a portion of that which God has given to us, showing God a demonstration of our trust in God. Um, even in the Cain and Abel story, which is such a weird story, uh, I always struggled when I was a kid to understand why does God like Abel's offering but not Cain's offering? Because they both offer something to God. And that's what starts the whole discrepancy that leads to Cain killing Abel. Uh, but the difference was that Abel gave God uh, some of the first fruits. He, gave, he sacrificed uh, a first lamb, basically saying, I trust that what I have is going to come from you. And Abel, or Cain gives an offering, and Cain gives an offering of what's left over. And God doesn't need either of those things, but it's a way of, of both of them demonstrating that they trust God. Uh, Abel trusts God with the best that he has, and Cain trusts God only with what's left over, with what Abel, Abel doesn't need, with what Cain doesn't need. Uh, so as we come to this time of offering, it's a time for us to really say to God, 
I believe that you've given me these blessings for a reason and that you want me to be involved in what's going on. Um, in terms of the church, uh, we are doing everything that we can to continue to worship, to, to do the ministry that, that we feel called to do, to, to care for the community around us and to live out um, a demonstration of God's love in the world in new ways. And right now is a time where we need to be more creative and, and think of church in a different way. Uh, the pandemic has emphasized that, but that was the case anyway. We are, as the world is changing, uh, the church doesn't need to always be the same way. It should be alive and not a museum. And so as we do that, we are, we are constantly working to do better things and we need help with that. Um, and so if you would like to give to the church, you can give online uh, at wexfordcpc.org slash give. It's very easy. Uh, you could also uh, mail things directly to the church. They get deposited every week. Uh, but again, remember that this time of offering is a time not just for financial gifts, but a time for us to recognize the ways in which God has blessed us and try to find ways in which we can uh, be involved in what God is doing in this world to help others see that there is hope, that there is love, and that we're all better together. So with that in mind, let us now present to God a portion of our tithes and our offerings. please join me for a time of prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name. Hear now our prayers for the church universal, for this congregation, its mission and ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, for all who need healing. Guide us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the Common English Bible, and it's from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Listen to the word of the Lord. 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that would make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, All who want to come after me must say, to, say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? For the human one is about to come with the majesty of the Father, with his angels, and then he will repay each one for what that person has done. I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see the human one coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we've now spent uh, the better part of a year with Matthew. And as we talked about the last few weeks, it's really important in Matthew to see where the stories fit. They aren't just a bunch of little collections of fables or things that you can pick out week by week. You really need to know where everything fits in a larger context. So this is a story that, again, continues with this thread of, of knowing what's going on. So this goes all the way back to John the Baptist being killed for no reason. Uh, Jesus tries to get away to mourn that, to pray. The people follow him. He feeds the 5,000 in there. He, he has compassion on them, preaches to them, and the disciples say, we should let them go so they can go get food. Jesus says, no, we should give them food. Uh, that's the whole point. And they feed 5,000. They collect 12 baskets full left over, uh, and then they continue on. Uh, Jesus, the, they go across, the disciples go across the Sea of Galilee while Jesus waits to pray. Then he walks across the Sea of Galilee to get to them. They think he's a ghost. He says, I'm not a ghost. Peter says, okay, call me out there. He calls Peter out. Peter walks in the water. Then Peter realizes he's walking on the water. He falls in the water. Jesus grabs him and says, why'd you doubt? Why'd you think that you couldn't do something that I said you could do? Uh, and then they get in and then they say, surely this is the son of God. And then uh, we have the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, it's uh, paralleling the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, in that one, there are seven baskets. There are just seven loaves in that one, and then seven baskets at the end. Um, and then the Canaanite woman, uh, where she comes and says, hey, you should, can you help my daughter? And Jesus says, uh, echoing what everyone's thinking, well, I'm here just to help the, the children of Israel. And she says, well, if you're really the Messiah, the Messiah is here to help everybody. And he's like, yeah, I am the Messiah, and I'm, I'm here to help everybody. You hear that, everybody? This lady knows what's going on. And so he helps her. And then we had last week where he, he is then talking to the Pharisees and says uh, to the Pharisees, you are, um, you're teaching the wrong thing. You are hurting people by telling them that God is something that God isn't. And uh, they're making everything about righteousness so that everyone is obsessed with themselves instead of concerned about each other. And that's wrong. And he says to his disciples, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees because just like a little yeast is what you need and it makes the whole dough good. In this situation, the yeast is bad because a little bit can blow up and, and a little bit of bad teaching can really kind of screw up your situation. So uh, then we had last week, right after that, uh, the disciples had no idea what he's talking about. They thought, they're like, oh no, we forgot to bring bread. And he's like, no, I, you've seen me make bread out of nothing. I'm talking about their teaching. And they said, oh, okay, we got it. And then he says, who do you think I am? Who do people say that I am? They say, we, a lot of people are saying you're a prophet. Some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're like Elijah or Jeremiah. And he says, well, who do you guys think I am? And Peter says, well, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, hooray, you did it. Blessed are you, and I'm going to start calling you Rocky instead of Simon because you're the rock upon which I'm going to build my church because Peter comes from Petros, which means rock, Petra. Uh, and that's half the story. That's where we left last week. So then it continues on from this. So immediately after that, after Jesus says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for, the Son of God. Jesus says, okay, well, let me tell you what's going to happen now. And he explains to them how he's going to have to go to Jerusalem and to be turned over to the hands of the Pharisees and teachers of the law and all these people who are, who are teaching the wrong thing. And he's going to be beaten and, and suffer, and then he's going to die, but he's going to be raised. Again, he told, tells them everything, spoils the whole thing. And Peter's response is, I would never let that happen. 
I will defend you, Jesus. Which sounds like a great thing. It sounds like something that we would reward people for being martyrs of the faith or defenders of the faith. We celebrate people who are willing to die to defend God or defend the church or to do these things. But Jesus doesn't take it that way. Jesus instead says immediately, get behind me, Satan. He calls Peter Satan. Get behind me, accuser, a tempter. Hasatan it just means tempter. So he's not necessarily calling Peter the devil. He's calling Peter a, a, a tempter. Um, he may be calling Peter the devil, but Hasatan uh, just means accuser's tempter. Um, it's what, the, what the, the serpent does in the Garden of Eden. It's what uh, Hasatan, the first time we see that, that word, is in the, uh, Job when uh, Hasatan, Satan, um, comes and says to God, well, what about this? Job just loves you because you give him everything. If you took everything away from him, he wouldn't love you anymore. And God's like, hmm, interesting. Okay, why don't you try it? So Hasatan is a complicated word. It's not even just as easy as saying, get behind me, devil. He's saying, get behind me, tempter, accuser, one who makes me question things. And he says, you're a stumbling block to me, which is a really interesting thing to think about with Jesus. You're a stumbling block to me. And he says something really, really interesting. Anyone who wishes to save their life must lose it. And anyone who is wanting to, who is willing to lose their life on my account will find it. What does that mean? So, an interesting thing in here, here's, uh, it's, a, it's a good time for us to look at things that are not in the Bible. Things that we think are in the Bible, that people have taught us are in the Bible, that we just assume are in the Bible, that aren't in the Bible. One of the major things that aren't in the Bible is there's nowhere really, nowhere really in the Bible where God asks us to defend God. What? But our whole system is based on defending God and based on standing up for God and, and being soldiers for God. And we have songs about it. I'm in Lord's army and I, uh, that, uh, our, that and we will fight for God and we will do all that we need. Crusades were fought, wars were fought, defending the church and the faith and God. The Bible never asks for that. Never asks for that. There are times in which, uh, where Paul and Peter and, and uh, people are asked to, Peter says um, in, in uh, the book, First and Second Peter, says you should always be prepared to give a reason for the faith which you profess to those who ask it, which is really important. That whole thing is there. To those who ask it is the important thing. Don't go around shouting it at people because that's a great way to get them not interested in it. But when people ask, why do you believe what you believe? Be prepared to give a reason for it. It doesn't say you should always be prepared to argue with people about, um, about God. And that's a different thing. So being prepared to explain why you believe, to know what you believe, that's, that's a good thing. That's very different than fighting for God, arguing about people with God, or defending God. Now, before you think, well, that sounds blasphemous. Why would we not defend God? Wouldn't, we, should, we should defend God every time. Well, let's look at Jesus. So Peter immediately says, I would never let anyone hurt you. And Jesus says, well, that's the wrong thing. You, you've, been, you've definitely missed the point. God is not asking us to hurt others or even kill others or even really argue with others over God. God is not vulnerable. And so God doesn't need us to defend God. And that's a pretty big thing, because if we are, if we take this on a logical path where God needs us to defend God, then that means that God is kind of weak. If God needs defense, if, if, if the only thing standing between crucifixion, between Jesus being killed and uh, Jesus' living is Peter, then Peter is pretty strong compared to God, that God can't save Jesus um, alone, that, that God needs us to step in for God. That seems like a, like a weaker God than what scripture is, is leaning to. Even the Old Testament doesn't really have any clear times where it's saying, defend me. Uh, there are times where 
uh, as, for instance, Elijah um, tests the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, but not to defend God, but to demonstrate God's power to, and to prove that the Baal is a, is a fake God. That's a different thing. It may seem subtle, but it's really not that subtle in terms of the difference. The God is never asking us to defend God or to, especially to take up arms against people in defense of God or the church or faith or things like that. So what are we supposed to do instead? Well, Jesus tells us right there, if you want to try and save your life, you should lose it. Now, what does that mean? Go die in battle? No. That's not what Jesus does. That's not what uh, the, those in the early church do. No one dies with a sword in their hand. None of the disciples, none of the martyrs die with swords in their hand or, or on the battlefield. It's not until much later that those religious wars start. Uh, the Christian church for a thousand years was, was deeply pacifistic, deeply in, invested in peace and willing to die for peace. So what Jesus is saying instead is that if, you, if, you, if you're willing to give up your life for my sake, you'll find it. So if you are willing to treat your life like it's something that doesn't need to be protected, but it, it's able to be shared, then you will find the real purpose of what our lives are about. But if you spend your whole life holding on to things, trying to protect things and defend things, whether it's your money or your house or your time or your energy or whatever privileges you have either given, been given or, or feel like you've attained. Um, if, your whole, if your whole motivation in life is defending that, then you, you're going to lose it all. What good is it for a man to gain the world but lose his life? Jesus is saying it, I mean, somewhat elliptically, but pretty clear that if we are obsessed with trying to hold on to things, we're going to lose it. No one can take it. You can't take it with you. And Jesus says this, uh, that, that instead of being focused on the things of God, you're focused on the, on the ways of humankind. That you are obsessed. You think that the way that you win is by defending stuff and, and stopping other people from taking things. And I'm telling you, the way that you win is by offering things to other people. It's a very different thing. Not out of, uh, out of fear, but out of abundance. If someone needs something, you give it to them. And such it is with God, that the gospel is not something to be forced upon someone like, we, like imperialistically, like um, as the age of imperialism comes in, here's some history, as the age of imperialism comes in, in the, in the, uh, around the, the turn of the second millennium, we have this age of discovery that happens in the 1200s through the 1400s into the Renaissance. And this idea of bringing culture and forcing it upon those people. There's a, the whole reason why all of South America speaks Spanish is not because that's an indigenous language at all to that area. We, don't, we kind of forget that. There's a place called Spain, and that's where that language comes from. And they conquered the entire continent. So everything south of the US border speaks Spanish because they were conquered by the Spaniards, by the Spanish Empire. We speak English because this place that we live was conquered by the English Empire, the British Empire. And we are descendants of that. It's, it's not that hard when we really think about it. And Christianity was brought along with that, especially um, with the Spanish Empire. They had the conquistadors, but they also then had the, the monks who, who in many ways tried to do good things. But oftentimes, they, it, you, where you have imperialism bringing a church uh, in the same way that they say, now you are all Spanish citizens, they also say, now you are all Christians. And if you have a problem with that, we have swords here to convince you otherwise. That is not in any way, what Jesus has in mind. And it's quite, in fact, the opposite of what Jesus has in mind. And so what does it mean to lose your life? Again, if, if we're not necessarily talking about martyrdom, that's not a requirement of every Christian to become a martyr, to be killed um, for 
professing their faith. Instead, what Jesus is talking about is that we need to, to not live so stingy with our stuff and our time and our energy and realize that just like, again, this, there's a reason why this stuff comes after. Just like the disciples have seen, don't worry about how much food you have. There's going to be enough. If the, if the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't enough for you, the feeding of the 4,000 should have been enough for you. And then even right after that, the, the disciples are worried that, oh no, we forgot the bread. And Jesus says, it's not about bread, man. It's not about this stuff. There's going to be enough. But we need to be willing to share it. There's not enough if we're not willing to, to offer up what we've been given to help those who don't have it. And so, what does that mean for us now? Well, just as Jesus in Jesus' era, we've got all these people teaching a, a different way of what God is about. And if you look at what Jesus does in his time, he is the most angry. He is not angry at sinners, really, at all. Um, he is angry at the church. He's angry at the chief priests and teachers of the law, Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, those are all the church people. Those are all the good people. And he's not mad at them for, for being, he's not even really mad at them for their power. He's not saying that power is bad. He's saying the problem is their teaching has become corrupt and that they are hollow and that, and they're obsessed with power. They're trying to hold on to stuff. He calls them whitewashed tombs, empty tombs that are whitewashed on the outside to look, to look good, but inside they're, they're vacuous, filled with nothing but death. Got some good images. And he's constantly going against them. Now, they're not all bad. He's not against them as a whole. He's not against the idea of organized religion or something like that. But he's against the idea of bad teaching. And so here's an example where we have been taught uh, a lot of the modern church gives us this uh, imperialistic, uh, triumphalist, warrior image of what it means to be the church, to be Christianity, that we are to conquer the world for Christ. That is the exact opposite. That's a Peter image. Peter, a wrong-headed Peter image, that Jesus says, stop it, get behind me, tempter, accuser, Satan. That is not what you're supposed to do. You are thinking of the ways of this world instead of the ways of God. The ways of this world say, finders keepers, and whoever dies with the most stuff wins. Uh, the ways of God say, there's enough for everybody. Give us today our daily bread because we know tomorrow you're going to give us more. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, let us be people of forgiveness and people of abundance. This is, uh, it's, it's a similar refrain. The point of the message of each of these sermons is the same because that's the gospel. The gospel is you've got enough stuff and if you don't have enough of everything, then we need to ask other people for that as things. But you have more than enough to share. We've only got five loaves and, and two fish. Great, that's enough for these 5,000 people. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I've only got so many hours in the day. Great, that's enough to help not, uh, some of these people. You don't have to help everybody in the world, but help the people around you. Well, I've only got this much money. Okay, that's great. You can help out these organizations. You can put that into the church and the church can, can do all the more. I don't have any money, but I do have some time. That's even better. What we need more than money is time. We need energy. We need people who have excitement and curiosity. We need humor. We need joy. We need uh, creativity. That is where we are the most stingy, is with our time and our energy and our, and our enjoyment. We need new ideas and uh, new voices. We need you. But I don't know enough, and I'm, I'm not good at preaching or reading or doing all, praying. Or it. Okay. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you need to be good at that. There's actually plenty of places in the Bible where it says you don't have to be good at that. Paul says completely, that's the whole body of Christ image, is that there are different parts of the body. And God calls all of them. And, and not all of us are meant to be preachers or teachers or, or good at prophecy or um, good at being deacons and caring for people. Like We all have different gifts. And God gave you those gifts. So bring those gifts to the body because we need you. If we think that the, that the church is only 
about people who are really good at singing or praying or preaching than we are going to have a really thin church because there's so much more to life than preaching and teaching and praying. And the church is about life. It's not about religion. It is about God being alive in this world and us being a community that can reflect that. And if we only reflect religiosity, then we become the Pharisees. The teachers, a lot of the chief priests who say, well, if you want, God loves you, but you need to act like this. And God loves you, but you need to do these things. God loves you, but only after this. Nope. God loves you right now. God has forgiven you right now. God has saved you right now. You don't have to do anything for it. But once you realize that, then we are free to respond in a way that is not obligatory, but a way that is representing a God who is not about needing defended, but a God who is about freely offering of God's self. And then we reflect that, that we don't need to be people who are in fear of our lives, who are in fear of our livelihood, who are in fear of our where our daily bread is going to come from. But instead we can be people who are willing to give all that away, to lose our lives for the sake of Christ, because then we'll really find it. Then we'll know what this whole thing is about. As we become obsessed with who's right and who's wrong, we need to look really at what Jesus is doing in, this, in Scripture. When we, when we go back to the Bible, we don't go to the Bible to, so it will defend and support the things we're already doing. We go to see what is Jesus really asking us to do. And Jesus is very clearly not in favor of taking up arms and killing other people. It just isn't. Like, there's just no time where that happens. Even in Revelation, when Jesus shows up, as we talked about, Jesus doesn't show up a mighty warrior and go and, it's not like Lord of the Rings and goes in and just kills thousands of bad guys. Jesus shows up with the word, with the sword that is the word of God and says, boom, you're done. Evil done. Evil's gone. Now we're going to, now it's paradise time. It's a less satisfying ending from a battle standpoint, from our culture of violence that we love, whether we admit it or not. We really like revenge. We really like, we don't like things ending in ties. I think that's one of the reasons why Americans struggle with baseball or uh, with soccer, uh, the European football, because we don't like an, a game that ends in tie. We need a winner. We need a loser. We need to win. And uh, God's not really that way. And it's very different when we preach God as though that's what God is about, about winners and losers, because we're all losers. But God is willing to, to live as winners in place of that. And, and it makes us view people differently, that every, we don't have adversaries. We have brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ who is everybody, not just believers, but everybody we encounter. And so when we are able to freely offer all that we have to everyone, to give of our lives to everyone, then we are following Christ. Then we are reflecting Christ. Then we are living a life that is reflective of the gospel, which is good news for all people. So let us go into the world and be that. Let us be people who are willing to, to lose our life a little bit each day. We don't have to be martyrs, but we have to be willing to share. We have to be willing to, to live without fear of where our bread will come from tomorrow. Give of yourself. Be willing to trust that God will give you more. And know that God is a God who gives life rather than a God who requires us to take it. Let us be people of hope and not people of fear. Let us be people of love and not people of hate. And more than anything, let us be people 
of joy and not people of indifference. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, a name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me it's time for us to go. But as we go, we go not bringing God to the world. We go instead following God out into the world, a world in which God is alive and active. We go bearing witness to that God in all that we say and do, loving everyone as much as we can, seeing every single person as a child of God, whether they know it or not, and loving them as we love ourselves. So let us go. Let us go into a world in which God a God of love, a God of joy, a God of life is there. Not a God of death and hate and, pe and, and war. Instead, let us reflect the Prince of Peace. Let us reflect the Lord of Lords. Let us reflect uh, a servant God who died for us, bringing life to the whole world. Let us go willing to lose our lives rather than trying to hold on to them. And in the process, let us find our lives. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Have a fantastic week. I hope you all stay safe and uh, do your best to do good this week. Let us be people of hope. Let us find the good in each and every day and let us share that with others. Have a great week. I'll see you later. Like, I thought I was waving at him. But that's great. I was waving at him. He's a nice guy. He's a UPS driver. All right. Have a great week.